So this Worldwide Tour is going to have basically two parts. Uh, I'll start with a high-level overview of how the optimization pipeline in the middle end looks like, like which different pipelines we have and how they are structured. And then in the second part, I'll move on to describing some of the more important optimization passes we have. We have a lot of optimization passes, so I'll only cover a very tiny part. The idea is that you get an idea of which pass is responsible for what, and also, uh, on the other hand, what some of the key restrictions on the passes are, so which they are not responsible for. And before I get into that, a uh, brief few words about myself. So I work at Red Hat, and our team or our sub-team is responsible for shipping LVM for the Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL operating systems. And in the remaining time, we do upstream work on LVM and uh, related projects like Clang and infrastructure and release management. I personally work on the middle end, uh, which is also why I'm giving this talk. And I don't really have a specific area. I mostly work on, like I'm open to working on everything that's not related to vectorization, essentially. Uh, I also work on integration with Rust and Rust-specific optimizations, and I always try to improve compile times, so uh, make the compiler faster, and to that purpose, I also have a compile time tracker to make sure there are no regressions or unexpected regressions. And I think that's, that's everything about me. So we can jump right into the main content with a like, bird's eye view on the compiler. And classically, we split the compiler into three parts, which is the front end, the middle end, and the back end. The front end deals with programming language specific concerns. So we have many different front ends, for example, Clang for uh, C and C++. We have also front ends for Rust, for Swift, for Julia, and many other languages that ultimately use an LVM uh, back end and middle end. On the other side, we have the backend, which handles the target-specific concerns. So depending on which CPU architecture you're targeting, is it x86, AR64, RISC-5, and so on. And between those two, in the middle, we have the middle end, which is supposed to be reusable for all programming languages and for all targets. In practice, uh, programming language and target concerns do leak into the middle end, but at least aspirationally, it's supposed to be kind of independent. And yeah, middle end is what this talk is about. So does it only sound to me like the S's are really sharp or? Well, sorry. Um, so in the middle end, we have a couple of different optimization pipelines. And the simplest one is the default pipeline which is what you get if you don't use link time optimization. So in the default pipeline, we take each input module and we optimize it independently of all the other modules. A module here is uh, in C or C++, just a source file, basically. In other languages like Rust, it's a more abstract concept like a code generation unit, which is kind of automatically partitioned. Now. Next to the default pipeline, we have the full LTO model, where we start the same way. So we optimize each module individually. And then during linking, we merge all of, all of those modules into one huge module and optimize it again. The big advantage of that is that we have now a global view of all the code. So, uh, we can, yeah, we can more aggressively optimize based on that. The disadvantage is that the second phase is not parallelizable. So the first one is, the second one isn't. So full LTO generally is very expensive in terms of compile time, especially if you have a very large code base. Which is why we have this nice compromise solution, which is fin LTO, where our uh, we first optimize modules individually, and then during the linking phase, we have like a brief global analysis, 
So at this point, we can do global analysis across all modules and also some optimizations across all modules. And the most important of those is that we can import individual functions from different modules into the current one if we think that those functions are likely going to be inlined, because that's like the single most important optimization, really. And afterwards, we can optimize the modules again individually, so this is nicely parallelizable. So we have a good trade-off between optimization power and uh, compile time. Now, getting back to the default pipeline. The default pipeline can be split into two parts, which is a simplification of the module followed by optimization before we hand off to the back end in the end. And as we go from left to right, we go from more canonical IR to less canonical IR. So what does that mean? Um, generally, you always have many different ways to write the same program or the same like instructions. And what the canonicalization process is about is that we want to take all of those different ways to represent something and reduce them to a single form. And then all the other analysis passes and transformation passes can rely on that single form. That's the general idea. So in the simplification phase, we run passes that make further optimization easier. So these are things like inlining, uh, which exposes more code to optimization. Things like mem to rec which converts memory operations into registers or an LVM just values, uh, which is again much easier to optimize further. Uh, things like loop invariant code motion, which moves code outside of loops. Really, most things fall into this simplification category. Uh, I mean, generally, we want to make things simpler. But we also have a couple of important transforms in the optimization phase. Uh, in particular, these are vectorization and runtime unrolling. Because these are, again, very important for performance, but once you have applied them, it becomes more complex to optimize the code further. Because they generally greatly increase the code size and make uh, the code structure more complex. Finally, uh, once we hand off to the backend, things become like entirely target specific, so we choose whatever is best for the given CPU. So this is where things are entirely non-canonical. This split between simplification and optimization mostly comes in when it comes to LTO. What we want to do in LTO pipelines is before linking, we only run simplification. And after linking, we run both simplification and optimization. The reason for that is that we have this second round of inlining after linking. So for example, what if we vectorize the code before linking? Uh, we vectorize the loop that has an unknown number of iterations. And then after linking, it turns out, okay, we actually know the number of iterations and it is one. Vectorizing a single iteration loop is likely highly non-profitable. So we don't want to do those kinds of optimizations before we have like the wider context. Yes. Zooming in again uh, on the simplification part. So here we have, again, three parts, uh, some cleanup at the start, some cleanup at the end, but really the important bit is the one in the middle, which is the uh, so-called CGSCC pipeline, which performs function inlining and simplification of functions. The core idea of this pipeline is that if you have a call graph, so you have a function f, calls a function g, calls a function h and i. What we want to do is we want to first simplify the leaf functions, so h and i, before we try to in those, inline those functions into the caller, which is g. So here, let's say we have uh, successfully inlined one of those functions. And then again, after inlining, we want to simplify the resulting function before we try to inline it into its caller, which is f. So what we always try to do is we try to make sure that, sim uh, that inlining 
works and functions that have already been simplified. This is particularly important for cost modeling so that we get an accurate estimate of how expensive it will be to inline that function in terms of code size. So I mentioned this term, uh, CGSTC. It actually stands for call graph, strongly connected components. And what this STC bit part is about is uh, if you have cycles in the call graph, so here you have function G is calling H, but H is also calling G. If you have a cycle on the call graph, uh, there is no real well-defined order in which you can process the function. So we just pick any order. But there is a well-defined order across those cycles. So like we would still first want to simplify i and then try to inline it uh, before we try to process g and h in some order uh, before we try to process f. Yeah, that's actually all I wanted to say about like the high-level design of the optimization pipeline. So all of those pipelines are available using the opt tool. Uh, so you can run something like opt default 03 or finaltio prelink or finaltio uh, postlink. And you can also print out using the print pipeline passes option uh, which passes this will actually end up running. And as you can see, it's a pretty long list. So admittedly, part of that is like not passes, but pass options. But uh, it's still pretty extensive, which is why I am not going to like go through each individual pass and try to explain what it does, because uh, we'd be here all day. And I guess this plain listing is also not really useful to understand what's going on. So it's more helpful to look at the actual uh, source file that the file set. So that's uh, pass builder pipelines, which has some comments. Uh, though maybe not enough to fully understand the ordering, but still. Um, so this here is the single most important part of this presentation. So if you take away anything, take away this bit. So I think uh, many of you already know Godbolt, uh, which where you can you know put in some C code, and then you can get out the assembly for different compilers, uh, for example. GCC or Clang or MSVC or whatever. And what you might not know is that since recently, I don't know, a year ago or so, they have added a feature, a native feature to display the LLVM optimization pipeline. And if you enable that, you get this kind of view where it lists all the passes that run. And for each pass that changes something, you get an IR diff before that pass and after the pass. So this is like the most valuable tool if you want to find out which pass is actually responsible for uh, doing some kind of transform. OK, and like locally, this is a bit like the print after all option and opt. But the print after all option is like just plain text and not so uh, convenient as the online viewer. So yeah, this was the first part of the talk. And now I'm going to move on to the like individual optimization passes. Starting with Memtorek. So if you put in this kind of code in Clang, um, which just does return x plus y. What Clang and other front ends generally do is to create a stack allocation for each local variable you have. So x and y here are going to be allocated on the stack using an alloca instruction. So even this very simple code generates this fairly complex IR with allocas, stores into those allocations, and loads from them. What Memtorek does is to um, convert these allocas, loads, and stores into, well, registers. We don't have registers on the IR level. It's just values or SSA values. So it will convert it into uh, something like this, which is much more useful for further optimization. And which is why like this mem to rec process is basically the very first thing we want to do in the pass pipeline. 
We don't actually use MemDirect, we use uh, SRAW instead, which is scalar replacement of aggregates. And that pass works in a two-phase process. So first it looks at all the stack allocations you have and how they are accessed. If it sees that actually the accesses are like in non-overlapping uh, parts, it can split up the allocation into those parts. So for a vector, you might have like a vector pointer, a vector size, a vector capacity, and it will split it up into three separate allocations. Once that has happened, we run the actual mem to reg, which will convert those allocate loads and stores into the uh, SSA values. It also knows lots of like little additional tricks to uh, handle cases where, for example, you do have some kind of overlap in the access, and you could represent it as a large integer and then do like bitwise insert and extract, but uh, I'm like not going to go into that in detail here. Instead, uh, let's talk about control flow optimization, where really we have, mostly we have just this one big pass that handles everything, which is simplify CFG. So this is one of our kitchen sink passes. For that reason, um, I can't really enumerate all the different things it does, so I'm just going to give a couple of examples. Um, for example, here we have some common code in the if and the else branch, and we can hoist it outside and only have that once. We can speculate. So here we have, again, if else. So we have explicit control flow with like real branches. And what we can do is we can take that foo call and we can always execute it if it is valid to do so. Uh, for function calls, it's usually not valid, but for other instructions, it's usually valid. And then we can pick the result based on a select instruction or a conditional move in assembly terms or a ternary operator in C terms. And it also does many other more sophisticated optimizations. For example, we can take a switch statement and we can convert it into a lookup in the lookup table. Something important to know in this context is that Simplify CFG accepts options. And it's a pass that runs many times in the pipeline, so it's like usually like run this cleanup between different phases. And at these different pipeline positions, we invoke it with different options. So some of the things, for example, this uh, switch to lookup table transform, those only run in the late optimization pipeline because uh, we think that like after we do this, it's going to be harder to further optimize. Other things are always executed, other transforms. And simplify CFG is a target dependent pass. So here is like one of the ways the back end leaks into the middle end. Uh, we have target dependent cost modeling via the target transform info analysis. For example, if we speculate instructions, so if we go from conditionally executed instructions to unconditionally executed ones, we want to know how expensive that instruction is. Uh, it's much more expensive to speculate a division which might have like 80 cycles or something than uh, an addition which might be one cycle. Um, yeah, so there are other control flow transforms, but really most of the things are implemented in Simplify CFG. Now, the next important category is instruction combining or peephole transforms, which generally take some like small sequence of instructions and convert it into a different small sequence of instructions. Hopefully a simpler sequence. So, yeah, unsurprisingly, the pass that does this is called inscombine. And this is another kitchen sink transform. So Simplify CFG has all the control flow transforms and inscombine is like the dumping ground for all the transforms that don't change control flow. One important aspect of this pass is that it uses some analysis helpers. Um, so inscombine uses insimplify, which in turn uses constant folding. And these are separated as follows. So constant folding, well, as the name suggests, it handles cases where you have constant operands and a constant result. So one plus one is three. 
in Simplify handles cases where you can fold something without creating an instruction. So if you have x plus zero, you can reduce that to just x without creating an instruction. Or if you have x minus x, uh, that's also always zero, even though you don't know what the value of x is. And in both cases, we, we don't have to insert anything new. What inscombine adds on top, so inscombine calls constant folding and it calls instruction simplification, but what it adds on top is all the transforms that either create or modify instructions. So if you go from uh, a multiply by four to a shift by two, you can do that, but you have to actually insert an instruction for that. So the idea behind the separation is that constant folding and simplification are something that can be reused by other passes while inscombine is, well, only inscombine can use that. So if you like contribute a new peephole transform, like the first question generally to ask is, does it have to create a new instruction or does it just simplify to an existing one? Depending on that, you either add it to inscombine or you add it to insimplify. And well, as I mentioned, it's really a kitchen sink transform or a dumping ground. So it also does a lot of things that are not really peephole transforms and that don't really belong into there, but are still put into there because it's a, a convenient place to put them. For example, what we often do is we have some other pass that solves a problem like in full generality. And then in inscombine, we solve the same problem in a very basic way just some simple cases. And we do that because the general pass runs once in the pipeline, while inscombine runs many times. So we can like paper over ordering issues, like pass ordering issues like that. Not great in terms of design, but uh, it's what we do. The final important aspect of inscombine is that it's a canonicalization pass which means that it's not allowed to be target dependent. So you cannot use uh, cost modeling in this pass. It's always supposed to produce the same canonical form uh, for use by the middlelands. If a specific target doesn't like that canonical form, what we do instead is in the back end, we implement a reverse or undo transform. But we try to like keep the form seen in the middle end uh, as like the single canonical form that inscombine produces. In addition, we have aggressive inscombine, which has the same purpose, but is for more expensive transforms. And the difference is just that inscombine runs many times, while aggressive inscombine runs exactly once. And finally, we have vector combine, which is well, for combining vector operations. And this one is cost model driven simply because generally speaking, costs of vector operations uh, are very, very different across targets. So it's not really helpful to try to go for a single canonical form in that case. Finally, the last combining pass I want to mention, um, yeah, I'm not really sure it's a combining pass, but I'm just going to call it like that is correlated value propagation, which performs optimizations based on value range information. Um, for example, if we have like a value X and we can prove, or lazy value info can prove that this value is between zero and 10, and we have a comparison of that value and 10, we can fold away that comparison. So this is quite important for uh, bounds check elimination in, in languages that have bounds checks like Rust. And it does all other kinds of optimizations based on ranges. For example, we can remove us, uh, replace a signed division with an unsigned division if we know the operands aren't negative. But generally speaking, um, everything that's implemented in correlated value propagation is also implemented in inscombine. Maybe more generally, we have certain transforms that we implement like this signed to unsigned division transform that we implement in many different passes so that we get access to different analysis and those different analysis are good at different things. 
For example, this transform is implemented at least in instcombine, which makes use of value tracking in particular known bits, uh, which is very good at tracking like individual bits and values uh, and at handling bitwise operations. Then we have correlated value propagation uses lazy value info, which is good at reasoning about ranges. Invar Simplify uses scalar evolution, which is good about reasoning values inside loops. And finally, IP SCCP, well, it uses kind of its own range propagation logic, and that one is an interprocedural transform, so it works across functions. So we implement the same transform in different passes to um, yeah, handle, to use analysis that are good at different things. Okay, uh, the next category I want to talk about is redundancy elimination. And we have two passes in that category that basically do exactly the same thing. One is early CSE for uh, common sub-expression elimination, where here we have two add instructions which are exactly the same, x plus y, so we can just replace the second add with the first one and drop it. And in addition to that, uh, early CSE can also do this kind of CSE on memory operations. So illustrated here, we have a pointer, we write to a pointer, and then we read from the same pointer. And if we can prove that the pointer hasn't been written between uh, those two instructions, and we can do that using memory SSA, we can replace, remove that second load and instead directly use the stored value, which is uh, v1 here. Now, next to early CSE, we also have GVN, uh, global value numbering, which does exactly the same thing as early CSE. It just uses a different implementation approach uh, called value numbering. And this is the more general and more aggressive pass. And because of that, it's also more expensive in terms of compilation time. So this one, for example, handles um, non-local and partially redundant cases. What does that mean? So for non-local, we have here an if-else, where in one branch we read the pointer, we load from the pointer, and the other we store to the pointer. And then afterwards we load the pointer again. We can save that second load and replace it with the phi node um, because we know the value this pointer is going to have in both branches. So if you're not familiar with phi nodes, uh, what that just means is that we will use v1 if we come from the if branch and v2 if we come from the else branch. And the very similar example for the partially redundant case is yeah, same as before, but here we are missing the load in the if branch, so we don't know the value in the if branch. Uh, we can still perform the same transform by inserting that missing load ourselves. And the benefit of doing that is that here we always had to perform the load, while after the transform we only have to perform the load in the if branch. So it doesn't fully remove the redundancy, only partially. And this kind of already brings us to memory optimization. So GVN already does a lot of memory optimization, but we also have some dedicated passes. Uh, one of them is memcopyopt, which is specific to memcopies and memmoves and memsets and so on. So one of the basic optimizations it does, if you have a memcopy from X to Y and from Y to Z, we can instead directly copy from X to Z and like save the intermediate copy. Of course, if the memory isn't overwritten in the meantime or something like that. Um, like the result actually doesn't look simpler, but usually after you do this, that uh, it's possible to drop the first mem copy as a dead store, um, which is actually the next transform, but first. Um, another important optimization this pass does is call start optimization. This is one of the key optimizations for languages like Rust that don't have something like uh, an RVO, so named return value optimization in C++. 
So basically, languages like C++ do this already at the language level, while languages like Rust require the optimizer to do it. And what we do is we have a function that writes into a temporary, and then we copy from that temporary into the final destination. It would be much better if the function instead directly wrote into the final destination. And that's what the transform does. Um, like, it looks a bit simpler than it is because there is a long list of preconditions to make that actually valid. The second optimization uh, on memory is dead store elimination, where we have two stores to the same pointer, and between those stores, the pointer isn't read. So we can drop the first one because it's just not observable. And the similar case is if you have an allocation on the stack, so an alloc A, and then you store to that allocation directly before a return. That's also a dead store because the allocation is effectively de destroyed when you return from a function, so it's not observable. Okay. Um, yeah, so the next category I want to talk about are some loop optimizations. I think, oh, I don't think. Um, these are performed by something called the loop pass manager, <coughs> which applies some sequence of loop transformations first to child loops and then to their parent loops and their grandparents and so on. And uh, this loop pass manager also brings loops into a certain canonical form called the loop simplify form and the loop closed SSA form, which I'm not actually going to explain here because it's not really uh, relevant for the following. Instead, let's look at some of the transforms. I think the one of the most important ones uh, and well-known ones is loop invariant code motion, which in LVM performs uh, three different optimizations. The first one is moving invariant code outside loops, so hoisting. Uh, we have like this foo call, and if we assume that it's always the same uh, for each iteration, we can just move it outside the loop into the pre-header. The other op optimization is syncing, where if we have some kind of uh, value that is produced in the loop, but not used inside the loop, we can instead move it uh, again outside the loop into the exit loop exit. And finally, we can do something called scalar promotion, where in the loop we load the pointer, then we do something with a loaded value, and then we store it back to the pointer. In that case, we can move the load into the preheader, the store into the exit, and inside the loop we can work on our SSA values just connected by a fine node. So this is basically a kind of memtorec pass, but specific to uh, values inside loops. So just like in scombine, uh, Likum is considered a canonical canonicalization pass, uh, which means it cannot depend on target cost modeling, and it also can depend on uh, profiling data from uh, PGO builds. It's not always a profitable transform, but we consider that all instructions are hoisted out of the loop uh, part of the of LVM's canonical form. So cases that are not profitable uh, are instead undone by other passes late in the pipeline, which are uh, loop sync, which can work with profiling information, so it can sync instructions into uh, cold blocks inside the loop. And machine sync, which can use target information, so for example, uh, sync instructions to reduce register pressure or something like that. Now, the second loop pass I want to mention is induction variable simplification. And this pass uses the scalar evolution analysis. And what scalar evolution essentially does is it tracks how values evolve inside loops. For example, uh, like standard example is a loop counter. You have i, which starts at zero, and then it increments by one on each iteration, and that's what scalar evolution tracks. And then induction variable simplification uh, simplifies these kinds of uh, so-called ad recurrences or induction variables, and also does some related optimizations like, uh, like dropping dead loop exits, for example. To give one example, um, here we have a loop that just sums up 
incrementing integers, so we have 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. And in this case, we can actually determine the final value of the sum variable after the loop. So what induction variable simplification will do is convert it into this code, um, which here at the bottom basically has the Gaussian summation formula, which is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. Uh, it's represented in a slightly odd way, so there is a like missing optimization opportunity here. But uh, I still find it kind of impressive that this kind of transform works. So this is going to leave behind a dead loop, and the dead loop is going to be dropped by the loop deletion pass, hopefully. The final loop transform I want to talk about is unrolling, which actually does, I think, uh, four separate transforms which are kind of related. Uh, the first one is full unrolling, where we know how many iterations the loop makes. And if it's a reasonably small number, we can just fully unroll the loop and convert the loop into straight line code, which is generally uh, much easier to optimize further. We can do loop peeling, where we peel off a small fixed number of iterations from the loop and then continue with the loop as usual. And we do that in cases where, for example, a value changes on the first loop iteration, but then stays a constant for all further iterations. Then we have partial unrolling, where again, we know the number of iterations, but it's very large. So like we could unroll a loop by 400 iterations, but it would likely like totally blow the instruction cache. Uh, so what we do instead is we unroll it to some small number of iterations, but we still have to keep like the loop back edge. And finally, we have runtime unrolling, where we don't know the number of iterations, and we can like do a combination so we can basically do partial unrolling, but we still have to uh, to retain an additional loop to handle the remaining iterations that don't divide evenly by four, if they don't divide. Mm. So something interesting about unrolling is that it runs both during the simplification phase of the pipeline and the optimization phase. It just runs with different configuration. So when we simplify, we only perform full unrolling and loop peeling because both of those transforms uh, make it easier to optimize the code further. While in the optimization phase, we run partial unrolling and runtime unrolling because those, well, they make the code more complex and harder to further optimize. Which, yeah. brings us pretty firmly into the optimization phase, uh, where the main other transform we do is vectorization. And vectorization is performed by two different, we have two different vectorizers. One is the loop vectorizer, which vectorizes loops. And it uses uh, something called vplan to model how this vectorization is going to look like without actually performing the vectorization yet, so without doing any IR changes. And that allows us to, for example, cost model on uh, different vectorizations uh, and find out which one of them is profitable. Additionally, if we are vectorizing, we have to be very careful about memory dependencies. So we can't have any like cross-iteration uh, memory accesses, or at least no invalid cross-iteration memory accesses. And vectorization uses uh, loop access analysis to make sure this is the case. However, in many cases, we can't actually ensure that using static analysis. What we can do instead is we can insert a runtime check that checks, OK, if are these like pointers far enough removed from each other? Uh, and if they are, we go to the vectorized loop. If they aren't, we go to the uh, original scalar loop. And this general approach is called uh, loop versioning. Finally, we have the SLP vectorizer, which stands for super world level parallelism. And this handles vectorizing uh, straight line code that's not in a loop. For example, if you had a loop that was uh, fully unrolled, 
then the SLP vectorizer would be responsible for vectorizing the, re the result. In practice, SLP tends to be a bit weaker than the loop vectorizer um, because, for example, because it doesn't support inserting these runtime checks and doing the versioning. So that's one of the reasons why uh, like fully unrolling a loop can actually sometimes like hurt the performance because SLP will not be able to handle it while the loop vectorizer would have been able. Um, okay, so this is actually the, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, in the procedural optimizations, so across functions. And the most important one is inlining, which I've already mentioned before. Um, we also have a couple of other important interprocedural optimizations. One of them is uh, inferring attributes and functions. So things like this function doesn't throw, this function doesn't write to memory, it only reads memory. This function always returns a uh, non-null pointer. Yeah, let's skip that. I only mentioned that uh, we also have a new pass called the attributor, which implements the same thing as this one. It's just much, much more thorough about it. So, like function address is really basic, while attributor is like handles everything. Uh, unfortunately, that one is not enabled by default yet, uh, in particular because it's just way too slow. It is too general. And finally, we have interprocedural sparse conditional constant propagation, which is one of those uh, classical compiler algorithms which propagates constants and in LVM's implementation also value ranges across different functions. I think the, the main interesting part about that transform is that it runs very early in the pipeline. So before uh, most other transforms. And the reason is that other transforms might end up losing information. For example, if, you, if, we, if simplify CFG speculates instructions, uh, we, we lose information on where they were in the original control flow. So this pass basically gets a chance to run certain optimizations before uh, the information is irrecoverably lost. And since recently it also can specialize functions, which means that like, if we see a function is, is called with certain constant arguments, we can clone the function and compile it for that specific constant argument. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is all I had to say. So thank you for uh, listening, if you're still listening. <laughs> and if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Wonderful, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, you finished a bit early, so we have plenty of time for any questions from the audience? Um, anybody have a question? Uh, I'm going to walk over to you first. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned earlier that I think inst combine is viewed as a canonicalization, so it's not allowed to be target dependent. But then there are other passes like simplify CFG, which does have target dependencies. So is there any fundamental reason why you would say that a particular pass cannot be target dependent or is it just a sort of pragmatic choice? Yeah, I would say it's a pragmatic choice. So like, as I said, like we try to keep the middle end target independent, but in some places we can realistically do that, like during construction combining, while in other places it's not really possible. Like there is, no way we could make vectorization target independent. That's just impossible. And so I would say like for ins combine, we we stand a pretty good chance to actually have like a canonical form that other passes can rely on. And so we try to maintain that policy, uh, that property as a matter of policy, while in other places we don't really stand that chance and we don't try to. I think that's basically the reason. Thank you. And it saves uh, some arguing if you just hard reject everything and don't reiterate it every time. 
Hi, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, I remember a few years ago, um, I watched a presentation really cool, um, Transformation Outlining, uh, which you didn't mention. Is there a specific reason for it? I thought it was quite cool at the time. Uh, so I should say I didn't mention a lot of optimizations. I only mentioned the tiny parts, which I think are kind of most important. Um, function outlining, I think it's not enabled by default. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so I mean, we have lots of uh, passes in LVM, which are implemented uh, usually as part of like academic or research projects, but but which are not really production quality yet. So they are not ready to be enabled in the default pipeline. And I think function outlining is one of those, but I'm not totally sure. Okay, thank you. All right. So in the combining section, you mentioned that uh, <clears throat> quite often we implement different versions of the same optimization because we use different analysis. You have example of LVI or like, val like value tracking. But quite often we would like to use, like combine the results of different analysis to make them stronger. And I don't think we have a consistent approach to this. So what would be, what would be your recommendation here? Um, yeah, I mean, so you're, you're definitely right that the current situation is not great. It's, again, one of those uh, pragmatic questions. For example, I think the attributor pass, which does this cross-function attribute inference, but also actually does, for example, range propagation and many other things, that kind of takes this integrated approach of uh, combining many, many different analysis into a single common framework and a single pass. And what you get out of that is something that's so slow that we can't enable it. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't really have a, a good good answer to, to how you can uh, improve that. The other big factor is that uh, we have to deal with analysis invalidation. For example, what Inscombine, on, the, the only analysis Inscombine uses is uh, value tracking, which is, um, which doesn't have any state. So it always recomputes the analysis result every time you query it. This is why uh, Inscombine can make all kinds of different transforms and doesn't have to worry about like, is the analysis still result still valid? Like how do I have to update the analysis result? How do I have to invalidate it? If we try to introduce something like, um, I don't know, lazy value info inside Inscombine, this will become a much harder problem. We would have to always think about how do we invalidate that analysis and so on. So, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question or not? Yeah, I think in practice we we often re-implement, like we want to make some analysis stronger. We go and re-implement things in that analysis. So analysis grows separately. And, yes. Uh, yeah, but they, they never converge into something uh, combined in a, a single like source of information. Yeah, that's uh, how it is right now, <laughs> unfortunately. Thank you. Um, thank you for this talk and a very useful tutorial too. I had a similar question about analysis. More specifically, is there any guidelines on how uh, analysis should interface with optimizations, like how to provide the info, uh, sort of API specifically, or is it just the free fall with each analysis having its own pipelines? Um, yeah, I think that depends heavily on the analysis. I mean, we have the general framework where the uh, where you can provide analysis to the pass manager and passes can fetch them from the pass manager and handle things like invalidation. But the actual interface is going to depend on the analysis a lot. Uh, for example, like Value tracking in Inscombine is a like always recomputed analysis, so you don't have any state. Then we have things like a dominator tree, which are pre-computed and then always kept up to date. And we have other analysis like scalar evolution, which um, have state, but they are always computed lazily, so as you query them. And like we have these many different approaches to analysis, and I don't think there is really a common a common way to do it always depends on the case. Hi. We saw that, uh, or you showed that the number of passes run by 
O3 is quite long, right? Yeah. Do you think it's possible to trim this pipeline by, say, 10, 20, 50 percent or some X percent and still maintain the quality of the of, uh, generated code for the majority of cases? Or uh, do you think that's not possible? Yes, it's possible. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not sure we can actually just uh, trim off any passes. Like usually, if you remove a pass from the pipeline, it does regress performance for at least some cases. Uh, but generally, I think there is still a lot of optimization opportunity inside the passes to make the passes themselves faster. But of course, uh, in some cases, we can also like you know, reorder passes to save some invocations or to reuse analysis results more uh, and not recompute them and do similar things. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Hi. Thank you, it was an interesting overview uh, of the, the general pipeline. And you mentioned some target dependent uh, optimizations. I'm wondering if you have any uh, examples to give uh, on the source dependent optimization. Like the, you had the, this uh, name value optimization that is more applicable to Rust than C++. Uh, is, is there any more, so, but, it, but it remains general. Uh, okay. So I think um, the front end or the programming language leaks fairly little into IR in the sense that we try to uh, represent everything using like generic IR constructs. But for example, if we compare Rust and C++, then they have very different semantics, right? And for example, C++ has something called the forward progress guarantee, which says that basically you can't have an infinite loop, uh, or at least not, not an infinite loop that doesn't like, you know, print something in it or, or whatever. And Rust doesn't have that. So how we solve that at the IR level is we have a special attribute, must progress, that C++ puts on functions and Rust doesn't. And this is how these uh, program programming language specific differences get into the uh, optimizer. And then for example, like I know scalar evolution uh, will either assume or not assume that the loop is finite, depending on whether that attribute is there and effectively then depending on what the source programming language is. So you mentioned how some passes, like inst combine, uh, combine a lot of transformations, uh, pull them all together. Uh, is, uh, in your opinion, a good current state in the compiler for parameterizing those sort of multi-pass passes for different optimization modes? And do you think there should be any more support for that? Um, so I'm not sure if I'm getting the question right, but generally we have support for pass options. Uh, like I mentioned that Simplify CFG uses that a lot and we also have other passes that yeah, are parameterized and run with different parameters in different uh, places. So that could be also done, for example, in Inscombine, uh, though there are no specific plans to do that, I think. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Okay, thanks so much everyone for your questions. Uh, we'll be back in this room in five minutes with the talk on hardware capabilities in Rust. And thanks again to our speaker. Thank you.